right, so officially good morning and another Wednesday wake up uh, is where we are today. We take a little dive in to God's word. Um, today is a is a weird one. Um, it's I guess I shouldn't say weird, but it's all God's word. But uh, the passage that we're going to be, uh, going to be going over is something that I think up until just last week I probably skimmed over all my life um, and. Uh, it's probably one that you may have just glanced over as well. Um, but in talking with Bailey last week, uh, I, I asked her about it because she happened to be going through the Gospel of John. And she said, yeah, I put a big question mark in my Bible right next to this passage. So that pretty much told me, OK, maybe uh, this is something that we should be digging into, because Paul said that um, all scripture is God breathed uh, and is worthy for teaching. So for me to glance over a little chunk of scripture just because I don't get it. Uh, is not giving uh, the, the right respect to God's word. So this is uh, three little sentences, three little verses uh, between what we heard last week of the cleansing of the temple and before uh, Nicodemus and Jesus have their little chat. Um, uh, so I'm going to read it actually in two different uh, versions, the New Revised Standard, which is what I normally read from, as well as the CEB, uh, Common English Bible. Uh, to see if you get a little bit more out of it, and then we'll dig a little bit into what it may mean. So uh, here now the reading of the gospel according to John. It's John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone for he himself knew what was in everyone. And from the common English, pretty much the same until the end, but check this out. While Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs that he did. But Jesus didn't trust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need anyone to tell him about human nature, for he knew what human nature was. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, even though it may be a little bit confusing. Um, so what is going on here? This is uh, a weird little passage that I think doesn't seem to fit at first. Um, it's after Jesus cleansed the temple. Uh, so this is after he uh, saw the temple being corrupted and, and took a stand and said, you know, you're not going to corrupt God's temple. And then whether that temple is a building or the temple is our bodies. Uh, Jesus is big enough to stand up and say, you will not corrupt uh, my father's temple. Um, then this happens uh, where evidently he did several miracles in uh, Jerusalem. This is after the Passover, or this is during the Passover festival, but um, this is after those events at the temple uh, and before he talked to Nicodemus. Um, so within that little chunk of time, he was in Jerusalem. He evidently did a bunch of miracles, which we'll never really know what they are, but John recorded that he did, so we could trust that that happened. Um, and this, these three little sentences are Jesus' reaction to what those people saw in him. And so in other words, people saw the miracles that Jesus was doing and made an impression, made a decision, made, made some kind of value judgment onto who he was, uh, and Jesus didn't like it. And so I think that these three passages, these three sentences, are lessons for us as to what do we see in Jesus? What, what is it that we value in Jesus? Or to be in bigger context, what do we see as a value in our religion, in our God, in, in going to church? What, what is it that we're looking to get out of this? And specifically, what is it that we're looking to get out of our relationship with Jesus? Because I guess there's a good way and there's a bad way to approach that. And that's what Jesus is telling us within these sentences. And it's pretty, pretty heavy stuff once we dig into it. So let's dig into what it is that Jesus was upset about. See, he saw those people being impressed with his miracles. And he could have been the most popular guy in the planet um, if he just fed on that. And this is where I always get impressed with Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. So he could have he could have dug into that. Wow, people really like me because of all of these miracles that I'm doing. I could be the most popular guy, but he didn't. He actually took the quite opposite approach. He said, he said, you are 
valuing me because of the miracles, because of the things that I can do for you. And if you think back, or if you read anywhere within the gospel, Jesus uses miracles not to show how cool he was or not to show how powerful he was. It's to show where he got his power from. So when he did miracles, he said, I do this to testify of where I'm getting my power from. I get my power from God. So in other words, what I'm doing is from God, but only I'm doing this because I want you to understand that what I say also is from God. And so, for example, when he did the miracle to feed the, the multitude, he followed it up with the bread of life um, sermon, which basically says that, you know, people have died in the past for eating manna uh, in the wilderness that God provided, but I provide you something that will allow you to have eternal life. And so if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have eternal life. People freaked out when they heard that message and they didn't want to hear it. And the, some of his disciples, well, not the 12, but the ones after that, they actually left him because of that message. And so Jesus used miracles to say, yes, what I'm doing is not from this earth, but what I'm saying is also not of this earth. And if you want to accept me, you got to accept the whole package. You can't just accept the fancy stuff, the flashy stuff, the, the miracles. And that's what he's telling these people. That's what he looked at those people that were impressed with who he was just because of his miracles. And, and he said to them, essentially, if you are just impressed with me because of what I can do, because of the fancy uh, miracles that I could perform, then I'm, I'm not the guy you're looking for. Essentially, what he told them is, is if you're looking for the Messiah, I'm not him. And he and he hid his messiahship. He hid his. He hid who he was from them, which is pretty amazing. Because as hard as it must have been for him to deny who he was to these people, he did because he didn't want them to understand who he was. He didn't want them to to appreciate who he was just for his miracles. And so that puts the burden onto us, and the question comes for us of what do we appreciate out of Jesus? What do we appreciate out of God? What is it that, that, we, that we want out of him, that we value of him? Is it, is it for the, the healing he can provide? Is it for the, the security that he gives us, um, you know, and, and will watch over us all the days of our lives? Is it, is it to protect uh, our family from getting sick, to, to provide financial support? Yeah, he could do all of that. But that's not why we should be attracted. That's why, not why we should be drawn to him. Because if we, if we put our weight on what he can do for us, then we run the risk of someday when someone gets hurt or when we lose a pet or when a grandparent gets sick and dies, we run the risk of saying, well, where was Jesus? Where was God in all of this? Why, why didn't he stop this from happening? If that's all we we care about Jesus. That's all the worth he is to us, is how he can service us today and into the future. Then, then we lose the point. And I think that's where Jesus was, was going with these people. He's saying, I'm more than that. I'm, I'm more than the miracles. I'm more than the flash. Yes, I could do all of that. But that's not why we should have a relationship. We should have a relationship because of who I am to you today today only. And so that's what I think we need to take out of this passage is why do we value Jesus? Why do we want to get to know him more? Is it for what he could do for us in the future or is it for who he is to us today? And so I started to dig into my own head and spend some time with God this week to, to come up with what I think I should, I should appreciate of Jesus. Why? why I should appreciate who he is today. And there are an endless number of, of reasons, but here are the first three things that popped into my head when I was spending time with God today. Number one is, is that he accepts me for who I am today. Remember, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was with God in the beginning. So he knows our past. He knows our, our future. He knows our story. He knows all the beautiful things that he built into me, all the great things that I've done in the past, but he also knows all of the bad things, all of the evil, all of the hurt that I have uh, said and done to people. And yet he still wants a relationship with me today. 
that's that's a good enough reason for me to want to know more about Jesus because he looks at me and says, child, you are precious. I want to know you more. I want to spend time with you today. Not, not for what we can do in the future, for what we can do today. And I think that's the first reason that I came up with that makes me want to know Jesus for who he is today, not for what he could do for me tomorrow. The second is that, that it says later on in, in John that Jesus is the light of the world. Even in the prologue, it says um, the light uh, has entered the world and the, the darkness has not overcome it. Um, that's my own paraphrase there. But basically, Jesus being the light of the world means a lot because sometimes you have to look pretty far to find the darkness in the world. But I'd be willing to bet that over the past month, you wouldn't have to look too far, too hard to find anger and, and anxiousness and resentfulness and fear and all of the things that have been bouncing around in this world. Well, that's all darkness in this world. And Jesus is the light of the world. It's not the light of Jerusalem, not the light of the Middle East, not the light for the Israelites or the light for the Gentiles, but the light of the world, meaning God's word is eternal and that statement is eternal for us jesus is the light for us today so i picture like if you ever been to a big old concert been in a big concert hall and you know at some point in time everyone always raises up their uh their phones and then turns on the flashlight and shines it around well picture that but picture everyone but one losing their battery power and no one else being able to turn on their cell phone and, and being in a pitch black stadium and even if that one person with that one cell phone was all the way across the stadium, you would still see that light, right? Because no darkness in the world can overcome one little light. Well, if Jesus is the light of the world. That is our beat, and that is what would pierce any kind of dark fear and anger and anxiousness. All of that is taken away by the light of the world. And that's enough reason for me to want to know Jesus today, because I need that darkness to be pierced today. And finally, Jesus is, and I'm going to use a word that I don't know if I really like because I think it gets overused and I think it's anything gets overused kind of gets lose its meaning. But Jesus is a savior. And what does a savior mean? A savior is something that saves, someone who saves. And what do we need to be saved from? And uh, in Romans, Paul said that that we have all sinned and fallen short from the glory of God. And he says that sin, the, the wages of sin is death. Not just death, like when you die, when you close your eyes for the last time. But I bet you, you know people that, that are alive, their hearts are beating and their lungs are going, but they go through life in a fog, in, in, in darkness, in, in depression, in, in sadness. That's death. And Jesus saves us from that death, from that sin, from that, from that payment that we need to make. If, if you look at the, any kind of, I don't know, like the judge, judgment seat or the courtyard or whatever else, they have the, the lady liver, a uh, lady, uh, <laughs> justice, I'm messing up my words here. And it's the lady justice is, is a blindfolded woman uh, holding scales. Um, and blindfolded because justice needs to be um, needs to be blind to who you are. So in other words, I can't. Justice isn't going to look at you and say, "Oh, you've been to church," or oh, "You you know someone." So I'm going to go give you a pass. No, justice is true, and God's justice is even truer. And and those scales that that she weighs, those scales are on one side is our sin, on the other side is who we are, and and those scales will always be tipped towards the sin side of things and we can say well we could do a lot of things we can go to church and, and that'll that'll do that or, or we can read the bible and and oh you know what will guarantee me to, to tip the scales in my favor i'll just go to seminary and i'll go get a, a master's degree that will never ever tip the scales towards your favor but you see jesus jesus died on the cross a long time ago before i ever sinned in order to tip those scales the only way for me to tip those scales, to, to be saved, to have a savior, is to understand what Jesus did for me. 
and accept that as true. So in other words, to accept what Jesus did before I even had the opportunity to sin, Jesus knew my story beforehand, knows my story in my future, and yet today says, son, daughter, I've already paid the price for you. I've already done what what needs to be done in order for us to have an eternal relationship, for you to live today, for you not to live in darkness, for you to live today. And so Jesus is a savior today, not for what he can do for us in the future, for what he can do for us today. And so I, I figure, just ask yourself, what do you want out of Jesus? What do you want out of your religion, out of your God, out of going to church? And, and, and try to understand that it's not about what he can do for you into, into the future. It's what he's willing to do for you today and the relationship he wants with you today. So let's pray. Heavenly God, I, I pray that, that your words were heard, that your message burns into our hearts, that the relationship that you want with us today becomes a reality. We pray all this in Jesus' name. We ask for your strength to make it happen. Amen.